panels, say on how tabletop role playing games or TTRPGs, as we love to call them, uh, promote social growth in their players. My name is Meek. I'm going to be your game master for today, um, but before we get into our panel, it's always important that we take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of land which we're meeting today, the Wurundjeri people, and that we express our respect uh, to any Indigenous or uh, Aboriginal people here, um, uh, past or present. And uh, also it's important, I think, to bring that up when we're talking about TTRPGs and storytelling. There's such a rich history there in Indigenous culture and storytelling, which comes out in what we do in the tables as well uh, in TTRPGs. So I said to you, I am going to be your game master for today, but I seem to have my players. Players? Uh, players here? I need some. Yep, there we go. Guys, come on, we've been through this. You have to be on time. I prepped the game. Your job is to wait. Why have you been behind the table? How long have you been? <laughs> Why did you even get there? This is my house. <laughs> um, all right, so let me check. Do we have now today? So we're going to be, uh, remember, we're picking up from the dungeon layer. We were. Wait, why are you wearing LEDs? And is that... No. We're here for D... We're here, we're playing the Don... D&D, right? Star Wars. Star Wars. Clear oh, yeah. Nice. Can I be the Jedi tonight? No, we... Wait, no, so no, you're no. here for Star Wars? Yep. Yeah. And then... Susie, what are you... What's this? You're not a... I'm definitely not a bear dressed as Dr. Susanna Emery, and I'm definitely not here for playing Right. Dan, what's with the LEDs? Cyberpunk, that's what we signed up for, then. Okay. Alright. No, that's fine. I just um I just had a really cool No <laughs> <laughs> stress. We can it's fine. I'm a I'm a games master, this is what I do. I can just um we can, well I guess maybe uh instead uh maybe let's start with who are you like why are you here? Who who are you? Uh maybe we'll start at the uh start at the end. Hi, uh I'm Ian Bennett, uh founder of Dice for Diversity Gaming in Canberra. Um, we do face to face role play, teaching people with neurodiversity uh, how to socialise and communicate better. Hi, I'm Dr. Susanna Emery from the University of South Australia. I'm a game design lecturer uh, and I get to look at how we can use TTRPGs and games in general uh, for social change, social growth. Um, basically, I get to play lots of games and say how we can change. <laughs> My name's Dan, Dan Machuka. I have a master's in primary education and work full time as a primary teacher. I work with one group of neurodiverse kids here in Melbourne, uh, playing a whole bunch of different games, experimenting, uh, getting them, work, getting them uh, growing. And I just recently released my own rule set designed for kids as young as four, people who might be non speaking, to still be able to join in on the hobby. Dwayne Fernandez um, from Minds of Play. I am the ambassador of Amazement here. Um, we've been playing D D online and Minecraft and now we painting. Um and started during the pandemic and we have now quite a few games masters and people in the group as well. Um four hundred and something players. It's fun stuff. Alright, well seeing as that's fabulous and you're all fabulous and maybe seeing as the beautiful game I have planned is not going to go to scale. How about maybe we instead talk about what we all know, which is TTRPG. So that's just but we'll we'll still we'll I'll wing it. We can make this alright, so Let's start with what is a TTRPG? Who wants to give me an intelligence check? Nineteen. Nineteen. That's pretty good. I don't know who you, but Two. I've got a minus. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a four. All right. Well, Dwayne, do you want to kick us off? What is a TTRPG? Well, a tabletop role-playing game is a game that we play a lot. Of, it's basically what the storytelling that it does. Um, usually around a table, but you can mimic that to be online, uh, to make it feel like you're around a digital table. That's the way I use it, and what about you? I'm so, a 19 year old. <laughs> uh, so for my part, I, I tend to use different games in d and I've been started using Power Buddy Apocalypse games, just I find them to be a lot simpler for my younger kids, the character sheets are a lot easier to follow, and um, yeah, they've been seeing a lot of success in being able to add to their own world in, in ways that other systems don't allow them to. Oh man. Um, we use Dungeons and Dragons as our basic set to use it to teach our program. Uh, but we also use Model of Home. Um, and then through school holidays we use a bunch of these games and other role playing games. Nice. Alright, let's okay, I'll allow it. That's a pass. <laughs> <laughs> Checks out. Um, so why would we get people to play TTRPGs which is not board games though? Like we've got a whole tabletop library out there, tables and you know, board games that have far less complex rules. Why TTRPGs? Well, the reason we choose TTRPGs over board games is because it's continuous storytelling. 
And if they're trying to assist with social growth, and we've got to build communication, yeah, the continuing story is always the way to go. You can always end it where you need it to be. But that's finite. And it's usually win versus lose. And that's not cooperative. I love cooperative to help us all kind of work together. That's a sign, right? It's not competition. What about you guys? Well, for me, I, again, I think it's a continuation, but also just it lets people have more agency in creating their own characters. You don't create the little straw hat, the little top hat in Monopoly, whereas you get to actually make this character that is either a part of yourself or something you want to be or something that you want to experiment with. Yeah, and we're working together, right? We're creating the story ourselves. So the players and the GM were all a part of this TTRPG that we've created. Something happens, we respond to it, we change the state of the game, um, and the game changes us as well. Whereas with board games, they're really, really cool, but often they have, like we said, more prescribed rules, so we don't get as much input into the story and the work experience. Yeah, and, and we find that, you know, we have consequence for action in our games, so that's limited to the space they're in, and that doesn't happen outside the room. There's a whole lot of lessons you can learn about life playing TTRPGs than just playing board games. I mean, I would say that sometimes, you know, if you put a double draw four on someone, I've had consequences of that action. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I totally, yeah, I can see. So with, a, with an RPG, you're telling a story. It's continuous, everyone's collaborating. It's not the DM against anyone. It's interesting. So ah. Sometimes it is. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, what types of systems? I mean, I obviously know about Dungeons and Dragons. That's the game I've played. Uh, it's obviously what... No. <laughs> that was a one. It's not the first person, you're okay. We checked it earlier. What what other is it? So D D D and D. Is there anything else that you play? So um, uh, we're looking at other systems that allow for good kind of consistent storytelling. Um, Avatar: The Last Airbender seems a fun system to play because it's episodical, yeah. and so each thing's in its own episode. We're investigating how to utilize that for social growth. So it's not the game itself; it's a, almost any game can work that way. Uh, which is the cool thing about these things. It's that when you use it in the intention of Showing different social aspects, like uh, identifying if can I cross can I cross that bridge, um, and how how we manage to cross that bridge. Give me a stretch. Well, oh, uh, maybe I want to talk my way. Right? Yeah. So the so different ways, and that's a fun stuff about what it is for our players. Um, but yeah, what are the other systems? Right? Um, well, it's funny you say Avatar because that is a powered by the Apocalypse game, so I already feel justified in my own opinion. Um, so, for those who are not familiar, it's a 2D6 game. Um, it's all, they're also the basis of Fortune in the Dark games, like Blades in the Dark. So, if you played Blades in the Dark, you played a, a slightly more complicated version of, uh, of uh, Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, but what it also lets the kids do is also add to the game. So, what they, they can do is they can spout lore, and if the if the GMs don't really have an idea of what the kids want to learn about, they can say, well, what do you know about this bridge? Oh, I know that there's another one, another half mile down the road, or I know that there's a special word that will make it reform, and the kids can decide that and add that on um, as part of that system. So it lets them have their more, more of their imagination um, on the spot, and look at the GM even to them and how it's preparing the board. Yeah, and that's um, why I really like one-page RPGs, like all the Dread Hout ones and all the, the one-page ones, because I don't want to remember a lot, and my memory's not great, so just having it all there on one page is, is so good for me to just be able to and get started straight away without having to. If you want to get started with TTRPGs, what great way to get started than by looking at one page rather than reading a book list of. Um, and so with the Dungeons and Dragons that we run, we've simplified it to make it super easy. We have modified content for like eight-year-olds upwards. Obviously, they're the ones that want to cut off wolves' heads and like eat their eyes and do weird stuff. Um, <laughs> teenagers just want to massacre things, but you know, as I said, consequence for action. Um, but we also play Star Wars. Uh, there's a game called Monsters of the Week, which is like real life Scooby Doo, um, and a bunch of other stuff. Which is you can use all of these lessons can be learned through the TTRPGs and the games and stuff because the situations happen and lessons can be learned out of those. You keep mentioning like social group and this idea of like you know telling stories and building the skills. So what is like how does gaming actually like how does that magic happen? Can you guys give me a persuasion check? Thirteen. Okay. Um, but 
We actually have like a. We can roll. Actually, I think I think Susie can roll with advantage. I, I, I would yeah. say yeah. <laughs> yes, you are the. I We got a help action. Yeah, you got a help action. Go for it. Go ahead. Roll again. Nice fifteen. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so yeah, how does how does uh, gaming foster social cohesion? Yeah, um, well, there's a whole bunch of different ways, um, but we were lucky enough to start working. Uh, myself and my colleague from the University of South Australia, Dr. Jaldron, uh, we were lucky to connect with Dwayne and start working with Minds at Play to actually look at what research is there that's out there to support this idea. Um, and what we found is that there was a lot of research into this idea of games for therapy. Uh, but not enough, a lot in terms of social growth. Um, but we did find that there was lots of potential for this. Uh, there was lots of research done recently into kind of neurodivergence, uh, and Milton in 2012 found something called the double empathy problem, which is basically this idea that neurodivergent people, like me, communicate really well with other neurodivergent people, and neurotypical people communicate really well with neurotypical people. But when we mix things up, that's where it gets complicated. Um, and that's where we get some communication challenges. Uh, and what we think, what we're thinking, and what the research is suggesting is that TTRPGs are a really cool way that we can work to kind of bridge that and kind of learn more about each other through play, have characters that um, embody us, that represent parts of us, and learn more about each other through playing. Um, so that, I think that's exciting. And what about what, what have you seen in your games? How does it foster? Well, what I. This is an opinion after doing having done this for a few years now. Um, but what I see is that social skills, just like any other skills, can be practiced and they can be trained. Yeah, just like a, a sports star goes out to the footy club and kicks the ball around and goes to practice every week, these kids can come in and they can practice social skills and, and interacting with each other, planning, persuading, working together as a team, um, disagreeing with each other in a way that they can still talk to each other afterwards. It doesn't sound like something that that. Everyone needs to practice, but some people do. And this provides a safe space where they can do so without any ongoing consequences afterwards that they need to worry about. Um, and it then gives them the confidence to go, well, I was really nervous about going out to a kendo club, one of my mates just started joining one of those clubs recently for the first time because she'd gotten confident enough in herself that she could go out and, and join an external party, which wasn't an option for them before they started out. Uh, do you have anything to add in? Do you have examples? Yeah. Yeah. Well, You've got a thousand. <laughs> throw some in person ones. Yeah. More than a hundred. Do you want some? Uh, we've got actually this young man, he was super excited that I wanted to use him as an example. When he first came to us almost three years ago now, he was, he basically hermited himself into his room, didn't talk to his family, didn't talk to anyone, didn't go to school, had massive germophobia. Um, to the point that when he came to us, he had to wipe everything down, including the tables and his own dice every time he used them. Uh, he's now full-time at high school. Um, he can go to conventions, not ones, these but smaller ones in Canberra, uh, by himself, and he'll wander around. He, we're almost at the point where we're thinking of employing him as an assistant to our adventure guides because his capacity for social interaction uh, and understanding of other people and empathy has just changed everything. So he's a wonderful example of what we found. Um, and the weird part was, first session we had, he did a really great job and his dad sat in and watched. And at the end, the mum came in to pick him up and she's like, what's wrong with our son? And I'm, his dad's like, what are you talking about? She goes, he's talking to other children. <laughs> and, and he spoke to them and it literally changed their relationship between child and parents. And, you know, it was beautiful to see, and he's come along so far. It's been awesome. I absolutely love that um, I have the same, but my people aren't in the same state. Uh, there's a kid in Golden that uh, that you would say something like, "We had no friends. He we alone by himself for lunch, um, and we taught him how to play in the way that, yeah." There's many ways to play D&D. There's the murder hobo way, mm -hmm. and there's the other extreme where we're overly, overly active. And the way we teach the game and use our content is that it causes them to be a good player. A player that you can just come on to any table and be like, this person gets it now, right? Um, and then we stop them from playing with us. In the sense that we only give them one table. I'm like, you want to play D&D with us? I only have one table for you. And you've got to go look for, I don't know where, 
but maybe a library, maybe they find the local game shop, they find the local library. All of our content is like bespoke, which means that any adventure that they go and find in the local game shop is brand new content. So go sit anywhere. You learn how to be a good player, and you can teach those things, right? And what's happened afterward is that his mom sent a review sometime later that said, um, my child now talks about his characters and other and things like just like, yes. Um, and when they leave us, which is what the objective is, so that they can go and make other friends, um, that's a victory, right? Like, that's, you taught them how to do things, go out there, go make friends in person, that's what you need. We start with a nice one. That's your one. I know they say wizards are magic, but that sounds like real life mm-hmm. magic, like right in front of you. Um, so then, okay, how about this? Seeing as we have messed up the systems anyway, I'm not really doing D and D. I was going to say, why do players come to you? Give me like a, a cool check. We'll say D six this time. D six cool check. One to three is a fail. Four to six is a pass. Who who's cool? Who wrote it? Dyson. Dyson. That had a jump. That's That's extra. Did anyone get a six? Is anyone super cool? I got one. Yeah, feel like you, I feel like that has to add like a plus two modifier. <laughs> so, six. Great, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so, why do you think people come to play with you then? You mentioned, you know, just different ways that people play, like libraries and things. So, why do they come to you? Honestly, it's their parents. Um, Canberra is one of those. It's a big country town at best, uh, with a bubble of politicians. Um, <laughs> but it's word of mouth in Canberra. Um, and we started with four kids three years ago, and we now have, I think, 140. Um, and it literally, if we're doing a terrible job, then people won't come. So we've been to a few cons. Um, we'll put our name out there, but not a lot. Um, there's a couple of um, special autism parents groups in Canberra, and we get spoken about on there fairly often. Um, but then sort of the parents bring them, and half the time they're like, no, I don't want to come, this is going to be rubbish. And then it's... We're the reason they go to school during the week, and they do their homework, so they can come to us and play. and And we have breaks in our sessions at the same time, so all the groups who are there all get to co mingle and um, get to learn other kids and and understand what the other kids are about, and they talk about all this cool stuff. And so the Minecraft. Anyway. <laughs> um, my side of it is really yeah, it's it's that, and it's it's the fact that. Um, we use, we start with like these kids over there that, that that's the first group of players that we've ever had. I think your point you had actually brings them in too. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's the fact that it's in the comfort of their house and they're willing to give it more of a go. And if they don't like it, they camera off, mic off, maybe give you some text. And we don't care, we don't react to that. We at least start playing the game and continue playing the game and then ask, what's your character going to And, it will be like one word answers, such as, um, and you give them up, you're running with a giant sword, or throw a javelin, very good javelin. And then you describe, uh, you take out the javelin, and you fling it, go maybe 20, it's, it lands, and it, and so suddenly you give up autonomy to the character that they're playing, guess what they got that character, and so suddenly you ask them, well, what do you do? And then it changes. They start describing the words. They suddenly go from off camera to on camera to on voice to on. Oh, and all happened in less than an hour. And uh, we, we track all these stats, right? Because you have to track things like um, on camera, off camera, voice, how they interact with the content, how they interact with these things. So we write reports. Yeah. And that's where all the additional administration magic comes in. Because we're seeing the change each session by session. Uh, and how they progress over 10 weeks, which is just 10 sessions. That's it. Nice. Yeah. Admin magic could be a really good new system. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's <laughs> like a role for bureaucracy. Yeah. Awesome. And what about, Susie, you mentioned the research before. Is there any other research that you have that you know, supports this? And Yeah. Um, well, I-, I talked a little bit before about how there was a bit of a gap. Um, and I think that's really important to mention. A lot of the research that exists is kind of from a therapist's point of view or kind of from a top down talking about other people. Um, so we did find that there's not a lot of player voice and a lot of divergent voice. And I think that's really important. We need to really make sure that for the research in this area does represent everybody. So players, GMs, everybody needs to be having input. 
Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is uh, why games are so good at this. Like, why are games specifically? Why are we looking at games this? Uh, and the idea behind that is there's this kind of learning theory called situated cognition. And if you haven't heard of it, it's this idea that we learn better in a relevant context. So we need a reason to learn something. Somebody tells us two plus two is four, we don't really care. Unless, you know, we're getting too much to all these, then I <laughs> right? So we need a, a reason for it. And games are really good at giving us that reason. Because the, the GMs and the players, we create these spaces um, that give us a relevant context, that allow us to play and explore and try things in a non-harmful way. We can say, oh, you know, I, I don't know what happens if I tell this guy to F off. I'm going to give it a go, right? Give it a go, what <laughs> happens? It affects the game. It doesn't affect the real world. So it gives you that opportunity. And that, yeah, that's why I think that real safety as yeah. well, like that safe place. I mean, you were mentioning before, like that confidence that you see in players as well, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, and what about what changes? I mean, we just mentioned a couple of anecdotes. Hey, what about Dan? What's like one of the changes you've seen in your group? Um, so one player in particular, I'd say, uh, kind of the profile I described earlier, she, she was practically non-speaking when she first started. One word, I think I got five words out of her in the first two-hour session that I had uh, between the four players. Um, but again, it's kind of like going from do you want to shoot your bow? Do you want to run up with your sword? And, or do you want to send your uh, animal companion? She was a, a, a ranger at the time. Um, going from like kind of really guiding them to now they're being like, I take out my laser gun and I <laughs> shoot five dudes in one in the head because she's every time she plays the murderer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she just loves describing describing how she murders. Um, but, and she, yeah, but. Uh, but it's just, it's been so great to see her go from being this, this shy, awkward person who who really struggled to to wanted to say how she was doing it to being probably now one of the more vocal players, uh, certainly one of the funniest, um, and uh, having a niche like all the board of players now have their own little niches uh, to sit and look at the monster each other as well. So it sounds like that's a lot of critical success, right? There's a lot of fabulous things there. What are what are some of the critical, maybe not failed, but like what are some of the pitfalls, things that kind of come out of, you know, doing this, you know, you're working with online, so is there technology, working with just people in general, humans tend to be, you know, unpredictable sometimes? Um, yeah, so uh, as we start to kind of grow, most people, I did not know about neurodiverse people until I started doing being up there when I was young. Um, <laughs> that's how it works. Um, but I was a 37. And in that space, that group of boys were the first group of boys that we played DD in an online format using Zoom, using kind of maps and news. And I thought they would just be regular teenage boys. At the end of that session, we had like a social worker saying to us that that is the most amount of interaction I've ever seen them do. And, and how, how can we do this? All we do is a session zero. But when you go to transit scale, the issues that you have is how do you count someone at distance? And how do you how do you tell a neurodiverse person, okay, watch your body watch your language, watch your tweets, and how do you count them? And that's when we were realizing our games might be having some trouble to translate that thing. And so we found an awesome group of people called Game to Grow, which is a psychology group in the US. And we put together like a five-hour training package with them. Or teaching people how to play TTRPGs, NPC and GPGs, um, yeah, Minecraft and things like that, um, in, in a way that with neurodiverse people, so that they can, well, control the situation and manage the situation. Before that, we had incidents, we would call incidents, and incidents would cause people to yell at each other, and then be angry with each other, and then we had very cold. We saw that drop like crazy, um, to the point that it's People now know how to manage neurodiverse people and, uh, in a way that allows a story book and actually allows people to be heard and received. But that's, when it's hard to reach out to someone in the middle of the house, you have to use your words, mm -hmm. which is again more communication. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, my pitfall has been when, I've been when I have been kind of mid changing systems. So, normally, so I did one campaign that was DD 5e. And when I reached the end of it, I wanted to have a change for them to experience something different, but also because the preparation was a killer. Um, so during school holidays, we just did a bunch of one shots with different systems, uh, kind of surveyed the kids on, on what they liked. Uh, we did Madcap for a while, which isn't very well known, but it's basically the kids could play as Looney Tunes character, characters. Mm -hmm. And um, and there was one player in particular who often would talk over the ideas and make lots of jokes, 
So I gave this character a new ability where every time I made um, everyone laugh, everyone else would get the benefit of not him. And <laughs> so kind of everyone was like, well, he won't shut up, but also I'm getting something out of it now. So it was a little, little, little frustrating <laughs> <laughs> with that situation. Um, yeah, so that kind of, yeah, that balance did work out really well with that particular group. What about DMC visions? Any yeah, um, well, just in terms of research, I think uh, it, I will say about how there's a gap, and also the research that exists, it's always um, 5E, it's always DMZ related, um, which is cool, like DMZ is very cool, but I think there's also a lot of other TTRPGs that can promote social growth, um, and we hear a lot about how you guys are using some of those. Um, so, more research in that area would be really, really cool as well. Um. Some of our, like we, all of our sessions were face to face. We had, a, a, you know, three months in September, in 2021, where we were all at home from COVID and that was awful. Um, but forgetting that if you've met one person with autism, means you just met one perfect person with autism and not everyone's the same. Like you occasionally forget that. And, and you try to react to someone who, the same way as another person, and, and it doesn't work. Because everyone's different. So we've, we've got a lot of things in place where we talk to our adventurers, we ask them how their week's been or how their day's been, and then we judge how we're going to run that session on how the kids are. Because if all four kids on a Friday afternoon have a ter terrible week, the session's going to be awful, like for them and for the adventure guy. So we've done a lot of planning, and most of this has come from experience of my life, because I'm neurodiverse and my entire family's neurodiverse and my extended family's neurodiverse. A lot of trauma everywhere, it's great. Um, <laughs> but um, just, just try to understand where people are to adjust what you're doing and make it easier for them to be able to be part of the game instead of starting to spin <laughs> up and things go sideways. So we've had dice thrown in the room and trays and miniatures and one kid threw a punch one day, that was awesome. Um, but he was having a bad week. Um, he apologised the very next week. Like we negotiated him to come back because he thought he was going to get banned, and we we don't abandon people. So he came back the next week. First thing he did was apologise to everyone in the room and the boy who punched. And he actually spoke to him this week, and he was like, "Oh, I don't even know why I did it." Oh, well, he knows why he did it, but he doesn't understand now why he would have done it. He said it was a stupid thing for me to do for a stupid reason. So, like, he's made a huge amount of growth, and we didn't know he'd had a bad week, and he just snapped and literally punched the kid next to him for almost no reason. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the pitfalls are not tr are trying not to understand who your players are, um, and what they're doing, and how their life is going at the moment. And if you can work that stuff out and let them open up to you and feel safe that they can do that, then you know your sessions are going to be so much better. And I think it comes back to the whole safety idea as well. And you know, the fact that I love that new line about, you know, we're not going to abandon, we're not going to abandon people. Like, the whole job is to try and help people and navigate that. So um, that's amazing. I mean, speaking of good things that you do, uh, I have like a little quest board uh, of sorts up here of uh, some little delightful words that I can see for, you know, for your team up here. Uh, who would like to speak to your... Yeah, uh, so <laughs> the bottom left thing was the hours of gaming of last term. So we played for 2,200 hours of gaming in 10 weeks. Mm. So that was 3.4 months of gaming within 10 weeks. I love this stat, and I told this one time we uh, knock on wood every time, is that we have hadn't had a single cancelled session since we started the initial tonight. So what is the thing that kills all TTRPGs? Scheduling conflicts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my Yeah. <laughs> you guys all know this, and so that's that's the thing about this space is that we allow for our staff is amazing, but they're our players. They they come from playing with us and then in the space, which means sixty percent of them are people with disabilities. And therefore having that type of service delivery with over hundred groups, concurrent groups in that time frame, uh, running D and D Minecraft and mini painting, um, is is mm -hmm. Great because the consistency in an area of neurodiversity allows us to identify things like when neurodiverse people are not consistent, because that's usually what triggers the pain. Um, and that's things like people are dealing with domestic violence. And when they miss a couple of sessions, we ask, hey, what's going on? Um, and it's because they're taking the essential and they run. And, and we know that if we're able to be the consistency for them, so we ask, what do you need? 
you will match up with that two circles in between your session because one thing consistent <laughs> is better than you know the pairs of stuff like that. So that's a cool thing about areas like this. And but I that's an online space, right? I, I can be consistent online. When you're dealing with a person, that's where it gets really complicated. And that's the stuff you're always enjoying, what you want to love no more, right? It's not always enjoying. <laughs> um, but we, so we started September 2020 um, after COVID. We wanted to start before it. We did not know when COVID was coming, but we did. Um, and we were three months, four months old, and ABC ran a story on us. ABC camera ran a story, which was picked up by ABC Australia. And in the start of February, it was their biggest story for the entire year. It had 5,000 likes and 1,500 people. Um, and we had people across the country saying, we want to do your thing. And I was four months old, and I'm like, no, that's not going to be a thing. Um, I'm neurodiverse, so I cannot be that organised. Um, so we concentrated on Canberra. Uh, we went from, at that time, three groups to six groups, and then I got a voluntary redundancy from Defence. And then they went to 12 groups, and now it's 30 or something. It's too many. Uh, for my range of COVID. But we're building a community. I don't know if any of these say, but we're, we're building a community for the parents and families as well. So on a Saturday afternoon, well, most parents dump and run, which, you know, if you've got neurodiverse kids, you don't normally do that. You hang out and you make sure everything's fine. Most parents these days just dump and run because they know the kids are safe and they know we're doing the right thing. But on a Saturday afternoon, there's eight parents who sit around, they talk about their week, they talk about what's happening with their kids in school, What's happening with NDIS, which is a nightmare. Uh, it, we all know. Uh, and we talk about strategies on, on like how to deal with plan management and how to deal with NDIS applications and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so we're building a community for the parents and a support network for the parents where they can talk about how bad their week was and how bad this and that was. And there's no judgment because we've all been there. And my, my kids are neurodiverse and one's on NDIS. And it's horrible. So we're just trying to build that community to keep the family safe and the kids safe. And I think we've been pretty successful so far. I think you literally have an evidence behind you <laughs> this success. Like, I wouldn't even have to ask for any kind of checks because it's literally right there. Um, no insight check needed. All completely there. Uh, nice. All right. Um, let's mix it up. Roll initiative. I only brought my oh, finally a low number. I got a two. 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 Uh, and it whips to you, uh, what's your, do you have a character name? What's... I just never heard that. Dan. I love <laughs> it. Love the and it whips around to you and says, Dan. Dan. What's your name at TTRPG? <laughs> 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 well, that's, that's a lot of you to the um, So at the moment, I'm, I'm really liking Dungeon World, uh, which is that, that GE card by the conference game that I'm playing with my kids. Uh, I also like 2400, anyone who likes sci-fi games, it's a really simple uh, one-page RPG that you can pull out and play a session in half an hour with. Um, I'm also using my system, but it's called Telling Our Tales, or Top of the Short. I use it in the schoolroom, in the classroom, to get my kids uh, as a reward for when they actually do the work. Um, it's a part of the sounds, and uh, moment. Nice. Thanks, Louise. Yeah. 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 Star Wars. Star Wars universe, every day, <laughs> if I could. Uh, but I can't because lots of the kids aren't into Star Wars like that. Um, <laughs> so, it's D&D is what I've played most. I just started Rogue Trader and with scheduling, we've done two sessions in eight weeks and we're meant to do it every week. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I pretty much try and play everything I can. However, finding time with a family and a business and stuff is very, very difficult. So I think I've ended up in the last three years I've played seven times and I've run 750 odd sessions. Um, I was averaging eight a week for a while. Which, if you're not running the same story, it will break your story, your, your brain. <laughs> <laughs> I think about Star Wars, is it the mechanics or the lore that is like... It's the lore. Mm. Uh, the mechanics of the... It, it's a lot of cancelling of symbols and stuff, and yeah. which the kids in school holidays don't really like. So I want to try and work out how I can change that thing, but it's the lore. If I can be like a smuggler or a bounty hunter. I would be every day. In, in the game. Mm. 
or in your life. <laughs> 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 That's fine. This is a judgment. Dramatic pause. <laughs> <laughs> TV Oh, what about What's my favourite TV character? Um, well, I do like one page. He's already said um, Honey Heist is really cool. It lays his own feelings. It's another. And with our beautiful four. Well, uh, Rich four. Uh, we barely get to play, and that's the problem, which is why I used to love doing interviews, because that's the only time I get to be a player, because uh, that's how we interview people. Uh, <laughs> the session for us, that's, that's the aim. Um, but d and a lot, and then we get to try a bunch of things, so uh, Star Wars is up there, Avatar is quite recently up there, and we're kind of looking for games that make sense, and so therefore most of the games that we play are linked to is it worth doing that it work like? And how can we what's what's the learning that will apply to it for community? And that's fun time. Amazing. Now I look I feel like Dan, yeah, I feel like we haven't even got enough cyberpunk stuff today. So let's go this let's go to like one of the last checks. Can you all give me a hacker check? D ten. They got three on the D10. I'm better at the D10. You dice, right? I'm going to dice. I'm going to dice. Honestly, I'll take an 80 at this. <laughs> you know, uh, but I feel I, like we've got a 10. 10. Yeah. We've got a critical success. So, Dwayne, tell us where do you get your hacking into the mainframe? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got some of them. Yeah, yeah, you're there. You've hacked in. Where do you see the future of me? The, the future of gaming for kind of growth is basically wherever there's a skill to be built um, and a need for the community. So drone racing has value because drone pilots are something that we need. Mm-hmm. Um, we're thinking about doing stuff with like League of Legends because losing with your best friend against your best friend and then going to work with them is something that will happen uh, and you still be friends and that. That game can be very harsh when you lose. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, games like that, it's all about what is the educational piece <laughs> that allows people to work together. And for a new diverse team that we love, um, is social growth comes from working together and understanding that we are all very diverse people and that uh, it is better that you work with somebody that you don't like. Because guess what? That's the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. uh, nice. um, so, speaking as a, as a primary school teacher, what I would like to do is see more of these games used in, in school in class. Um, just as an anecdote, uh, so I've got a grade five class uh, that I teach every Friday just before lunch. They're a bit tough to love, is the reason the reason for them. Um, <laughs> but what I've done to try and increase engagement is said, completely voluntary, but anyone who wants to stick around after class, I'm going to run a D and D like game for anyone who sticks around. The only requirement is you need to have done the schoolwork and a third of the class. Now, not only turn up, but spend the rest of the week tell me that they're going to be the spaceship pilot this week. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Um, so the fact that I've, they've given me another tool as another carrot to encourage them to do the work, um, I think can be applied very easily elsewhere as well. And being able to run a game in twenty minutes is fun for me. It's not a, it's not work, but that's what. Well. Congrats. Yeah, I rolled into you again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, consistency though, honestly, respect the consistency. <laughs> I would hope that the stigma of playing role play games keeps diminishing, um, as it has over the last sort of ten years. Like I grew up in the eighties and nineties, and I was one of those jerks who would beat you up if you were playing DMD, if I found out about it. Um, but I, I hope the stigma around it keeps reducing and role-playing, especially tabletop and obviously online, keeps expanding and becomes far more normal for people to do it because it's so enriching to your own lives and your own self-confidence and it brings down your anxiety in social situations where you know, you've already practised talking to people who you don't know in situations that you're not familiar with and then you can take that into the world, out into the world and, and part of that, obviously... Neurodiversity is seen as normal. Like, sure, it's not neurotypical, um, but we are everywhere and we are coming for you. I mean, um, <laughs> 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 we're, we're, like, we're, we're at least half of the society, and you know, some of that is, some of that is, is trauma, and, and some of that is how we've grown up, and some of that is just 
you know, you've got ADHD or you've got autism um, and other things, obviously. But um, I'd like that to be accepted more widely than it is. Um, mostly, for the most part, I see it as it's mostly accepted, but if people say stuff about it, I'll clap back because I have no issues with it. Um, but yeah, that's what I'd like to see. More people playing, more games. Yeah, more yeah. diversity. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's really important. Um, we don't have statistics about uh, players and developers in uh, TTRPG specifically, but in Australia we've got statistics from who plays games and who makes games. And that diversity is there in the player base, but we're not seeing that diversity in the developer communities. So we need more people to be making TTRPGs. So have a grow, make them, especially one-page RPGs. Um, you know, you can make them really quickly. Um, get a more diverse community. If we're all making games, we're all part of that community, then we're increasing that diversity. Um, and there's this thing in games called procedural rhetoric. And uh, it's like a really fancy word, but essentially what it means is like the rules and processes in games influence the real world. So if you play a game that does a lot of, um, promotes social growth, then in the real world, you'll have a stronger sense of social growth. So if we make these games that embody these things and these ideas and our perspectives and our thoughts and our diversity, that we can promote those ideas with the world and increase the awareness of those things. Can I just tag on to that? Um, if you are interested in creating your own RPGs, um, if you're not already, I'm a member of ARC, Australian Role Play Community, they're on the Discord, they're down in the Tuklet Weekly RPG Hall. They provide a membership program. You can reach out to, to people who already released their own books there. There's, they're in the process of starting that pathway where you can go from an idea to a uh, publisher and publisher yeah. and have access to play tests and everything else you need. Uh, it's definitely worth reaching out to them. And they do game dunk as well, which is also game dunk, like a short form kind of presentation to the end of the game. Awesome. Um, well, look, we are going to have a little bit of time if there's any audience questions. Just before we do, you know, I had a beautiful monologue, maybe you can just like leave at the, at the end. But I feel like if I was to tie up this, you know, kind of, you know, uh, mixed game that we played, I think the common theme, the common thread between all of it is there is this heart and this, you know, ability to create a safe space for people to be who they are, growing themselves, and not only the players, but the communities around them, which is huge. So despite the fact we didn't get to play the game I wanted to, I think you can all walk away as heroes today. So well done. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, now we do have a couple of minutes if anyone does have any questions for our esteemed panelists about maybe how they run games or, or you know anything about their we've got some our lovely enforcers will help us with some microphones. Um this question is obviously for Dan. You said you're a primary school teacher. Um, teaching students, so, and I'd like to be playing games, right, be playing, what games would you recommend for especially younger, neurodiverse kids? Look, it really depends on the age. Um, when I made my system, I was working in a special needs school at the time, so I had specifically designed it to be able to play with those kids, so we're talking uh, five, six, seven, eight year olds, so being able to use with imagery so kids can point to what they actually wanted to take. Um, I hope I sent you a link. Uh, I think it's up there on the QR code as well. Um, but aside from that, if you do, it really depends on the needs of the kids themselves. There's systems for like Tiny Dungeon, uh, Hero Kids, they're all designed for younger kids, but more importantly, designed for shorter time spans because they just don't have the, the three hour attention span that I'm supposed to have as an adult. That's about sad. Thank you. Do you have anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I just want to have Um, I had a question about like the research side of stuff. Um, because me and my mates, we talk, we talk about uh, the characters we play a lot and how the characters that we play can help us deal with like personal issues. Like, for example, I had a character who was, this is during the COVID, right? Because I first started playing this group. I had a character who was very, very angry. And like, you know, and I was talking to a friend about like after the campaign, the campaign had finished, we were talking about characters. And I was like, yeah, I think I used that character's anger to deal with my own anger. And it was a safe, like, um, way to kind of release that anger and also understand how to release it properly and when it's bad and, like, how to deal with that stuff. And I think it's really interesting. I was wondering if, I was wondering if like, the research is kind of pointing towards that as well or, like, if you have a lot of 
books can do that. Yeah, well, um, you're, you're, you're basically talking about how you created your own relevant context. So, like that Satoshi cognition I talked about earlier, you created that in your character and in your game world to be able to explore things in that set space and then play them. That's a, a lovely explanation. Um, I an example of a person who lost his father being told. Uh, we all knew and um, that he had lost his thing. The rest of the players didn't. And he decided to come and join us for that session. Um, his wizard was very violent that session. Lots of NPCs died, lots of things happened, and they thought that was really all in that session. But no walls were destroyed, no hit marks on any moment, no damage to anybody else. Following session, arm was never. So I also have personally received refugees um, to understand the empathy of things that I had to deal with. I actually played the boss that I hated for two years and had to last him to level 15, so you understand how long that is. Um, and, um, and I found that I got the best fights with that boss while I was playing that fight. Uh, and I'm like, this is amazing. This is how long this time for to make my game to start a business with me in that way. But your, your situation is absolutely real, and that's a really useful tool to learn how to deal with uh, the situation of even someone you hate. Play them as a TTRPG. Yeah. 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 Speaking of ghostly dreams from an adult state, because I saw that I had the dreams mentioned from that a lot, but currently I live in. Job application? Sorry? Job application? If you want to go to the website, we have no, people in every show, state show, and... Show. Oh, as a player, yes, we have people across the nation. So, the good thing about us being online is that I'm not local to Canberra, uh, and that's the territory I do not send people to. It's well, the territory I don't send And we play in every time zone in Australia. And we have WA and, you know, Northern, and we have Games Masters every month. So, yeah. Question there, we have questions there. I like the questions. Guys, I was worried before. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I work for a guy as a plant manager, and I'm wondering what we could do to make your jobs easier. I have an answer to it. <laughs> um, this is a relatively new thing. So you saw the original players that we had with that didn't tell I think I may have told you the impossible. But when we wrote these reports and we were writing about the observations and everything else, we talked about the progress. I have a letter back in February from the NDIS internal review space that says, <laughs> and I can't believe because when we started this thing in 2019, we actually had this thing. It says, uh, Dungeons and Dragons is required and necessary for a person on the spectrum as it needs a reasonably necessary test. So the way we play in that episodical weekly format with reporting is compliant with the NDIS. And so much so that you'll find us on the website uh, and there's a few different articles, but this is information we now give plan managers yeah. um, to make our lives easier. The, for plan managers, basically, show me the money to make our lives easier, just let us do our jobs and grouping and everything else. Mm -hmm. But we can send you that information. Yeah. To, to add to that, we have, well, my wife used to be a plan nerd with NDIS, and so she did that for 18 months and had to have six months off because of a social matter. Yeah. Um, it was terrible. Anyway, we like we're getting psychologists and GPs and pediatricians and stuff referring their their patients to us, and and we recently had Ferris, who's a, I don't know if they're down here, but they're certainly in camera, and we got an email saying it was well, we got re a response saying it was the best NDIS report that I'd actually read, like for this person, like he said it was just fantastic. So, like Dwayne, we're very personal. We have very personalised NDIS reports. And why is that? Because so, you know them for so many hours yeah. of play. Yeah. That's right. And, and we, we notice them and we see what changes they have. And, and we will talk about their flaws because everyone has flaws. But, you know, being a parent of a child with a disability, you know what their flaws are, even if you don't want to see them, which I don't like to see them with my daughter, but she's extremely disabled. Um, and that's, you know, she's in the Catholic system with school and she is the most, she has, requires the most assistance in, in Canberra. Um, and I don't, I don't really see that. I gloss over it, even though I'm a parent and I see everything. I adjust my life and her life to make it easier, um, along with my wife. But yeah, we, we see these kids and 
and we know where they start and we meet them where they are and we try to progress them and, and give them growth in all these regions and and because we do session reports uh, and then we collate them and, and give them to, to plan managers and stuff like that and so we, we can see the progress they're making and see where they still need to do work. So there's a lot of, obviously Dwayne knows, there's a lot of admin behind the kind of stuff we're doing to make sure that the people who come along get the best experience and actually get lived experience as part of it. I will always be low than psychologists playing them at like $110 for this <laughs> But this is how you practice in that safe space where people like, yep. you know you're going to fail, but they're going to make fun of you. Well, make fun of your character because that's what's supposed to happen. Right? And then you learn to practice. That's a cool thing about playing this. That's a cool thing about games in general, right? You know, have fail and do it again and try again. Talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> and then making that fun. As it's in my world today, yes. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask uh, how do you emotionally regulate your players in the session and what happens when that fails um, when they're all meltdowns and you shut down? Do you want to do that? Yeah. I, can, I, I can go first. So we always have top colour. Uh, in our so we've got four rooms and we all have always have someone there to provide top cover. So if there is a meltdown, that person is if if they decide to throw dice or throw stuff and get physical, then we'll get them outside and we'll bring them down. So everyone who does top cover for us has a uh, vast experience. I think there's three of us and we have a hundred years experience with disability and and autism and stuff. So the strategies we use to bring bring them down and sometimes sometimes that's just sort of every five minutes just checking in with them and letting them see that then they calm and, and and we do that kind of stuff but in the room it's it's all about talking to them and trying to find out what's happening and why they're feeling that way and whether it's they're scared or they're just angry or something else not to do with what's happening in the room has set them on edge and then whatever's happened in the session they might roll one and lose it and that's not uncommon. Um, but then you work through going, you know, rolling one doesn't mean you're going to fail everything or you're against like 10 guys. It doesn't mean you're going to die. Let's, let's bring it down to a rational thought of, okay, there's 10 people here, but I still have an escape behind me. Or, you know, I still have four allies. So it's trying to rationalise and sort of just bring it down in a nice, calm way. Um, but yeah, as I said, we've had people get punched. Only one um, in... Three years, which I'm very happy with. Um, but we've, yeah, dice get thrown once in a while. Um, and, you know, that's not something we reject people for. We work through it. But I've had a player as well um, adjusting the location, just the, the moods and energy just varying wildly. And honestly, it's just more about giving them the space, letting them participate as much as they want to. Or, you, you know, you just need to sit in the rest for a while, or just make your characters just, you know, in, in, in transit. While the rest of us work with problems and just letting them know that we're there for them when they want to play or not. And it's just as they can learn how to do it. So it's not going to be scheduling conflict, but maybe it's still just because of the Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's why I'm um, On the same thing, it's we also, yes, yes, all these things, plus uh, when they register, we ask them what condition and how do you manage it. So you ask them how do you manage it, and then we do a session zero. Will you identify the things that are going to be absolute triggers? Spiders? Or something else, right? So you adjust the adventure. Storytelling. Change the mini, figure out the tools. With the TTRPG, it's easy to change it within the narrative. But then you also add the systems in place, such as additional people. And for us, the games masters run the game, but the game master swoops in with the word help that occurs in a channel that the players can't see. And they're there in less than 30 seconds. And then there's loot, then there's off camera, and there's deafened, and there's a whole bunch of other things, and the things are going completely sideways. There is an incident report, and then we engage in with the social structures to make sure that they all go into bed. And most of the reason an incident will occur in the nature is because they feel safe to release the entire week of work that they're going through. This is their safe space, where they will tell us that they're transitioning, where they tell us that they are. Um, it's their family don't know that they're changing and who they are and who their baby is. Why? Because they play with dragonborn for the last hour as a male and they realize that that's not true. 
And what I love about you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a neurodiverse and a um, LGBT, you are very friendly in the community mm-hmm. because it doesn't matter what the plan is, when you are. It's an adventure. Yeah. So everyone has to be diverse. Mm-hmm. But, um, and the other thing with us is all of our staff are neurodiverse. Some um, uh, actually have, you know, diagnoses, and some are undiagnosed, but they are definitely neurodiverse. <laughs> 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 I only got diagnosed in, in March, so um, yeah. I know. Um, but yeah, so our people know what it's like to have things going in your head and, and what your bands are like, so it's a lot of experience, and we're very... Sadly, we're, well, not sadly, we're very, very picky on who we choose because we need to have the right people because it's a safe space for kids and, and adults um, to be who they want to be and not be judged for that. Can I just add, it's always important, I think, for any games, that's kind of any public facing game, mm-hmm. have safety tools, so if you're not familiar with the terms like X cards, things like that, so that way, if you're not familiar, basically, you have a big X on the board, if you're entering a space and the kids aren't happy with, they can just touch that, the scene will get kind of misted over, you find out what's triggering them possibly, and we can move on. For example, we play some some like amongst the giant spiders. I had one player who was terrified of spiders, so they very quickly started fighting space crap out of the cave crabs because that <laughs> <laughs> was triggering for them. And so we just quickly changed over, stepped with the same, they just couldn't fit grab instead of shoot webs. So just having those safety tools for any game, I feel like, not just uh, for this kind of game. Do you do any adult games? Yes. Not in that creepy way. Yes. So if you're in Melbourne, if you don't know what already familiar with, there's a group called Actually Playing Real Life, Rob Cole and, and um, uh, so for short, that we kind of meet in Discord, we arrange games three times a month for players to come in and join, usually non 5 games. games. Uh, so people can come in, have a go, not specifically, again, not specifically in your universe, but they're part of the community, so they'll be there and have fun familiarity with all the safety tools. Um, and if you wanted to try that out, uh, then please come check us out, come reach out to us. Um, and yes, we have at the moment we have four adult groups uh, running. Most of our groups are sort of ten to twelve, as parents get diagnosis uh, diagnoses for their kids, uh, and then they want them to transition safely into high school. And so our, our kids, for ten to fourteen, is is our biggest demographic because it's that first couple of years of high school and the lead up to it. And we have adults, young adults, teenagers, and even children. Start off ages 7 to 12, and then those are the different categories. Um, and session start on Tuesday. So what can we do? Well, um, unfortunately, my older friends, that is all the time we have for our conversation. But can we get a big round of applause for Kate, Kate, Thank you so much for coming along and have a good day.